This is Chief Master Sergeant Graham Williams and former Sergeant Aaron Quinn, the Tuskegee Airmen. They're going to give us some talk today. Give them a round of applause. Get the wire up here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, what a crowd. <laughs> All of your pilots? <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> I am Chief Master Sergeant so Retired Grant Williams, a native of Halifax County, Virginia. I entered the military service at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and 26th of February, 1942, I was sent to Tuskegee, Alabama for basic training. And from there, we went up to Michigan for additional training and eventually to Italy where I served with the first black pilots in America. When the war was over, I uh, went into civilian life and stayed until the Korean War came along. By that time, I was ready to come back and America was ready for me. I was recalled active duty for the next 24 years. I served at various bases throughout the states, overseas to Japan, Turkey, and Vietnam. Finally retired from an Air Force base at Hampton, Virginia, as the Chief Master Sergeant. Our topic today is about a group of men who have to fight for the right to fight for the country. I say that because people of color have fought in all the wars we had since the Revolutionary War days, but they have never been allowed to serve in positions of responsibility. They're used as an excuse that they have no place to train black people. This just came out of uh, an Army War College study that was conducted in 1925 which concluded among, anything, uh, among other things that people of color thought within themselves that they were inferior. They thought that they were cowards, that they would run in face of danger. America thought that they certainly didn't have the intelligence to fly an airplane. And if by chance they could fly, they didn't think they could fly and fight at the same time. This group of men that I'm going to talk about today dispel that myth and they changed the course of history because they did some things that no other unit before or since has been able to accomplish. I know we could talk all day and we wouldn't complete everything that you might have, might expect to hear, but we're not going to bore you with a, a long speech. We'll just give you some of the highlights, hoping that you will ask questions concerning those things that you were concerned with. There were two distinct phases of our military service, and I'm speaking of myself and Sergeant Quentin. The reason I say there were two phases, one was the beginning of the program, and the other was the conclusion of the program. So I will talk about the, basically about the first portion and Sergeant Quentin will talk about the second portion. He was a, a part of the second portion 
I, had, I didn't know what was going on at that time because I was way away someplace else. Initially, America tried their best to avoid opening a school to allow colored people to train. But when that was done, these men did, were taught that they had to perform and perform well in order to maintain the status of the military. They had to catch up with those people who were already in the military and learn how to do the job from the ground up. We had a man to lead our group who was one of a kind. He was a man who had served four years at West Point, the United States Military Academy. And during that time, he was the only man of color there. He was the only man who had a room to himself because no one else would room with him. During the week, he took his meals along with his classmates. On weekends, they had what they called open seat. So he had to stop at each table and ask for permission to be seated. He was consistently refused. But he was determined to be a success. So he withstood all of that situation and he was determined to succeed. <coughs> to show you the caliber of man that he was, out of a class of 276, he graduated number 35. I think that tells you something about his determination to succeed. So he withstood all of the things that they required him to do and graduate. He was the only man who had any tra uh, aviation training. He learned early on his, or during his time at West Point, he had a, a flight and he decided that he wanted to be a pilot. So he did everything he needed to do to graduate. And of course, when America decided to open the training for Negroes, he was one of the persons who was in that first group. Thirteen men started out in the training program, and one of them was Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., the man I'm talking about. He was already a captain when the, when the first squadron was formed. So being the senior man, he became the leader of the group. And he worked very hard with his men, explained to them what they were up against, let them know that this wasn't a playtime. They had to follow the rules and follow them without uh, question as to why. Initially, one squadron was formed, which was the 99th Pursuit Squadron at that time. Very soon thereafter, the Pursuit Squadrons, the name was changed to Fighter Squadrons. A little later, as the war progressed, they felt the need for additional powers, and a group was formed with three, three additional squadrons. They became known as the 332nd Fighter Group. When the 99th was combat ready, it should have been combat ready, nobody wanted to accept them overseas. And 
The president's wife, Mrs. Roosevelt, took a trip down to Tuskegee uh, to see why they weren't being sent into battle. And as I understand it, uh, she took a, a ride. Now, some of you may think that she took a ride with one of the pilots, or one of the cadets. She rode with C. Alfred Anderson, who was the chief flying instructor. He was a black man. But she said if he could fly, then the other men with all the training they were getting should be able to fly as well. And they opened the way. The 99 was eventually sent overseas. At the time when they left Tus Tuskegee to uh, go overseas, the three other squadrons, the 332nd Fighter Group, was sent into training at another field. All of us left Tuskegee at the same time, thinking that we were going someplace for additional training. But when we arrived at Selfish Field, Michigan, we found that the first squadron had broken off from us at Camp Shanks, New York, and had gone overseas. We didn't know where at that time at that time, but we did find that they had been sent to North Africa. America, prior to the time of the training program, had done everything they could to prevent this action from occurring. Uh, they finally found an organization in North Africa which agreed to accept them. And, uh, but they didn't get a chance to get the training that should have, that they should have got. Being a new organization with no experience in war fighting, the commander did little or nothing to help them. And in fact, he went so far as to try to send them back, get them sent back to the States, claiming that they were incompetent. But when the study was made to see what, was, what the problem was, they found that the men hadn't been given the proper opportunity to experience combat. These were raw pilots, so they didn't have the experience. Colonel Davis was called back. Colonel Davis is the man that doesn't talk about the leader. He was called back to the States to defend his men. And he made an eloquent defense. And uh, the War Department agreed that they hadn't been given an opportunity, the proper opportunity. And he was allowed then to take the three additional squadrons back overseas. By that time, the 99th Fighter Squadron had worked their way up through Sicily and into Italy. They had fought the Battle of Anzio and had shot down at least 16 of 16 aircraft by the time the 332nd went overseas. When the 332nd arrived in Italy along with the support group in which I was assigned, we arrived in Italy and the 99 had been through the lower part of Italy and, had, as I said, had fought the Battle of Anzio and they were up near just uh, losing the name of the town. Foggia, Foggia, 
Uh, they were at Fort Germain when we arrived at Toronto, and we went up to uh, a little place called Monte Fino. Early on our uh, visit there, we had something happen that uh, hadn't occurred since AD 379. Did anybody have any idea what I'm going to talk about? No. One night, we thought uh, we heard hail on our tents. We were in parameter tents. And when we looked out, it wasn't hail as we thought it was. But it was lava from Mount, from Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius had erupted in AD 379 and had been quiet until that point. But we had to move volcanic ash with bulldozers just like we do moving slow, snow here in America. So that was quite an event, quite a welcome for us. But uh, we realized we had a job to do, so we went to work and helped to clean the area so that we could mm. do our training. As the war progressed, the units moved further north. The, uh, eventually, uh, the three additional squadrons merged with the 99 and made the only four squadron fighter group in Italy. Now, the war was pretty hot and heavy by that time. And America was losing a lot of bombs to the enemy. Uh, it was a little difficult in accepting for the first squadron, for example. <coughs> they were doing, doing the best job that they could. But there was some hesitancy in accepting and finding what type of missions they would need for the four squadrons that they had now. And it came a time when America was losing an awful lot of bombs to the enemy. In fact, they were losing as many as 25 bombers a day. And each of those planes carried a crew of 10 or more men. You can use the map and see what kind of situation we were in. General Ira Eka, who was running uh, the heavy bomber program in England, was sent down to Italy to see if they could do something to uh, reduce the number of casualties. And he was operating a heavy bomber program using B-17s and B-24s. Each of those aircraft had a crew of 10 or more men on it. And they were losing bombers left and right. He asked Colonel Davis if he, his men could help. Colonel Davis agreed that they could and they would if given the opportunity. When he got that assignment, I was told that he explained to his pilots that if they were found to leave those bombers unaccompanied, trying to become aces, he, he recognized that early on. What the problem was, the bomber pot, the, the, the fighter squadrons that had been escorting the heavy bombers was trying to become aces. They wanted to shoot down five out there so that they could get the names in the record. He says to him, or, or to his men, if you were found to leave these bombers unattended, 
you will be grounded and court martyred. Now, I want guys to say they didn't mind being court martyred, but they didn't want to be grounded. They wanted to fly. So they took him at his word, and he got the assignment of escorting the heavy bombs. Uh, it didn't take long for the bomber pilots to notice that there was something different. They had no idea who it was who was saving their bombs. How many of you saw the HBO movie with the Lawrence Fishburne and Cooper Goody? Well, you might, you might recall a scene where the uh, crew, bomber crew, had been saved, brought home safely, and they wanted to find out who it was that it was. They went to the base when they were told where the pilots were from. The bomber pilot went to see to talk to them and thank them for bringing them home. But when they got to the base and they were greeted by black pilots, he wanted to know where the pilots were. And they said, we are the pilots. And he told the driver, get me out of here. You're in the wrong place. He didn't think that the, these were black cops who had been escorted them and got them home. It didn't take long then before they realized that the 332nd and with, along with the 99th, because they were combined at that time, that they were the ones who were saved. So when the Americans found when the the American black guys found out what was going on. They decided to let everybody know who they were. So they got the brightest red paint they could find, painted the tail of some of the red, and the Germans, when they saw that, they called them, the Germans called them uh, Blackbird. The Americans called them red tail Americans. So uh, with this in mind, the bomber pilot, the fighter pilot, decided to let everybody know that that's why they used the red tail. During the course of the war, the 332nd fighter group destroyed or damaged a total of 409 enemy aircraft that's in the air and on the ground. They came home with something like 750 air medals, 150 distinguished flying crosses, 14 bronze stars, 58 purple hearts, three presidential unit citations, three soldiers medals, one legion of merit, one red star, Quite a feat for a group of men who supposedly weren't capable of flying. Now, the war progressed and Americans were saved to a large extent by the effort and contribution that these men made under circumstances that were far less than pleasantries, and the guys came home, yet nobody recognized or even knew what had been accomplished. It took many, many years before there was any rec recognition of these fighter pilots who had done a magnificent job without 
it is, it is perfect. Eventually, a few things happen. Among those, they received, or we received, the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest award that America can, that the, the Congress can issue. But we were very proud of the achievements of the 337, and we feel that it plays a great role in the change of course of American history. And Sergeant Clinton will talk to you a bit about another part of this organization, uh, and he will tell you because he knows the part that I didn't have anything to do with, but you will find quite a bit of and then we will, after he finishes, we will answer questions from, from the audience. Thank you very much for your attention. You've been wonderful.
General Hap Warner, some of you, I know a lot of you have heard about Hap Warner, Commanding General of the Air Force. He tried everything he could do to prevent that. However, he was unsuccessful because President Roosevelt had promised that if he was elected, that that group would be formed. The group was activated at Selfridge Field, Michigan, in, 19, in January 1944. Now, I'll give you an idea of what the racial climate was around Selfridge Field and Detroit, near Detroit at that time. There had been a race riot at, in Detroit. Several people had been killed and incarcerated. At Selfridge Field, the commanding colonel there was very prejudiced, and he had told the motor pool, don't ever send me a Negro chauffeur. They made a mistake and sent a Negro chauffeur one day because his chauffeur was on leave or whatever. And the colonel had been drinking. And when the soldier arrived, the chauffeur, he pulled out his side arm and shot him. So that's how it was in that time. The group was under the command of uh, General Hunter, First Air Force, and his orders were that there would be no mixing of races. At no time would any white personnel be in a position to have to take orders from any black personnel and to build a, a separate officers club for the black officers who were being trained to fly these D-25s. Well, there was uh, some uprising, some talk about it, and the War Department decided that he couldn't do that and told him he had to stop. So <clears throat> he stopped and he moved us to Garden Field, Kentucky. Now Garden Field was a small inferior base really. I only had one hangar, certainly not enough space to hold four squadrons of these bombers. The reason why that he gave that he did that was that the weather was better, which was untrue. The flying weather was not that good, and the base was totally inadequate. But the real reason was they still wanted to maintain segregation at all costs. And the white officers were invited to the officers club at Fort Knox. And the black officers were not. Now it seems strange or uh, idiotic that there's a war going on. We're supposed to be training a bomber group, but the main thing, the main purpose here is to maintain a, a segregated uh, form of controlling this group. We stayed there for a short period of time, and there was, we weren't progressing, and the Pittsburgh Courier, the newspaper I just mentioned, started printing headlines, why aren't our boys overseas? And there was an investigation by the War Department again and said that this place is inadequate 
and it sent us to a better place, Freeman Field, Indiana. Now, Freeman Field was a, a, a wonderful place, based as compared to down the field. But the people, the town of Seymour, was very unfriendly. They had put signs in the windows that we don't serve color, no color to allow. Some of the officers wanted to try to take their laundry to the laundry. They refused to take the laundry, even though they were washing prisoners of the German POW's laundry. So that's when, again, Colonel Selway, he set up two clubs. By the way, he confiscated the NCO club. And he said one club would be for instructors, and the other club would be for trainees. All the instructors were white and all the trainees were black. And some of these trainees, some of these blacks classified as trainees weren't really trainees. In fact, one of them was Span Watson, who had been with the 332nd in combat in Italy. Well, one the night, a group of three of them Officers walked into the number one club, so to speak, and they asked to be served. They were refused service, they were asked to leave, they refused to leave, and they were arrested. Shortly thereafter, another group went in and they were arrested. By the end of the week, 61. Officers had been placed under arrest. So Colonel Selway shut down both clubs. And he issued a directive, base order, which read to the effect that if you knew who you were, then you were supposed to go to the club. So that's it. And he called in all the officers. And he had them read it, or read to them. And he told them, this is a direct order to sign it. And he reminded them that in wartime, refusing a direct order, you can be put full firing squad. Now imagine yourself being in that position. And 101, of those men refused to sign. And 101 were all placed under arrest. We were all shipped back to Kentucky. Well, finally something good happened. The war was over in Europe, and Colonel Davis and a cadre of men from the 332nd officers and enlisted men were assigned to Godman Field. Colonel Davis was placed in command of the base and all those officers were relieved of duty. There was a court officer. But all of those men except three were exonerated of any charges, there was a letter of reprimand was put in their file, which stayed in their file until <coughs> President Clinton uh, had it, gave it permission to have it removed. Of the three that were court martialed, two were fined $150, and one was given a dishonorable discharge because he was charged with pushing the provost marshal. That was also reversed by President Clinton. With Colonel Davis in charge, we were 
I was sitting around, did a 180 degree turn. We were finally getting ready for combat. We had been accepted to go to the South Pacific. And I use the word accepted because at that time they, they had to figure out what theater commander would want to accept an all black email. In fact, we all had everything packed up, ready to go to the South Pacific, and they dropped the hay bomb, so the war was over. <clears throat> the group then moved to uh, Lockbourne, Ohio, and the 477th was deactivated. The 332nd remained, still, it still remains today, but it's a different group. Some of those men remained in the service and went on to uh, integrate the Air Force when Truman, President Truman issued the executive order. Others went on into civilian life. In the service, uh, Colonel Davis became a four-star general. Lieutenant Chapter James became a four-star general. Colonel Charles, and he has a record of flying 409 combat missions in civilian life. Colin Young became the first black mayor of Detroit. Percy Sutton became the uh, borough president of Manhattan. And the story goes on and on. Of course, we were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. We're invited to the inauguration of President Obama. So that's the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. If we left out something, we're open for questions. We're trying to answer your questions best we can. Yes, sir. We now have uh, 54 chapters of the title of, of, of Tuskegee Airmen telling the story. Now, the membership is open to anyone who wants to carry on the legacy. We do have a group not separate from ours involving descendants. Uh, my daughter, for example, is a life member of Tuskegee Airmen. And anybody who wants to carry on the legacy can join. We have a local chapter, or the Tidewater chapter of Tuskegee Airmen, that covers the this portion of, of Virginia. Uh, and as, as I said, we also have, to encourage uh, the young people, we have a youth program where they can get training. They get assistance with uh, learning how to fly. So we do have uh, some change to go down and connect the young people 
with, uh, with the test began program. I had a pleasure meeting you two weeks ago in Port News, and it's always a great pleasure to meet people that didn't relate with the past to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, it's always like to see the experiment. I guess it was bound, I guess they tried to prove that it's not going to make it. Did they provide equipment like older aircraft, second hand aircraft, force flying to the sea mirror just to try to make sure that it would fail? <laughs> Originally, uh, when they went over nine and a half went over the seas, they had the P-40. And those P-40s were the ones that were flown by the line pattern. And I talked to some mechanics when they came. I was an airplane mechanic. And I talked to some mechanics when they came back, and those planes were pretty shaky. But later on, they moved up, they got the Bell Air Cobra, they got the P-47, and the P-51. All of these 25 were the group that they were new. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, step out of your feet. Thanks for coming out. 